Thank you so much for being with us today and taking part of the project Speaking Truth to Youth. I'm going to start by asking you a few questions. First one is, what events or beliefs in your youth kind of led you to become an activist? You know, in part, I was very involved in the church community in my town growing up. And so there was always a, a big emphasis on social justice. In part, my father was a tremendous outdoorsman and hiker and things. So we spent a lot of time in the woods and in the mountains. So I had an early sense of their beauty and majesty. And in part, it was watching the example of people who were mobilizing adults, who were mobilizing to oppose things like the war in Vietnam. My father, who was very mild mannered, was nonetheless uh, arrested um, at a demonstration against the war in, when I was nine or 10 years old. And I remember that very well. And maybe the final thing was that I grew up in a town called Lexington, Massachusetts, which was the site of the first battle of the American Revolution. And so my summer job as a youth was giving tours of the battle green in my tricorn hat. And I think it convinced me early on that there was no uh, contradiction between patriotism and dissent, that in fact, they were very much aligned. And so I have a feeling that that, that may help explain some of my uh, revolutionary tendencies. What continues to motivate you to be an activist? And what, what gives you courage as well? Well, I'm not really an activist by nature. I'm an introvert. Uh, I'm a writer, which is uh, often an introverted profession. But at a certain point, it became clear to me that simply writing more books about climate change probably wasn't going to move the needle. I, I, I wrote the first book about climate change way back in 1989. And, you know, my books have been widely read. And we, we've won the argument about climate change. Uh, our problem is we've been losing the fight. And that's because the fight isn't about data and reason. It's about money and power. And that's what fights are usually about. And the only way to beat the kind of money that's in the fossil fuel industry, the richest industry on earth, is to start building movements of people. So that's what I've sort of learned how to do. So it's why I've um, overcome some of my natural introversion and um, made myself into more of an activist over the years. What gives you courage right now? The sight of more and more and more people pouring into this movement. You know, when we started 350.org, it was kind of a first iteration of a global climate campaign, a kind of beta, if you will. Um, and it worked pretty well. That was 10, 15 years ago. But we knew, we've known all along that we needed more people always. And so what fun to watch Extinction Rebellion and then to watch the Sunrise Movement and the young people who, you know, got behind the Green New Deal. And then to watch the Climate Strikers and Friday for the Future and the 10,000 Greta Thunbergs that exist all over planet Earth, the young people really stepping up. Um, it's really been fun to see all of them and get to work with them. And, and that gives me hope. Not that we're going to stop global warming. Sadly, it's too late for that. But that maybe we'll be able to slow it down to the point where it doesn't overwhelm our civilizations completely. The pandemic itself it has no silver linings, but it probably does teach us a few lessons. It probably reminds us that reality is real, that you can't make COVID microbes or CO2 molecules compromise or negotiate. It reminds us that you have to move fast. Those people, that, those countries that flattened the virus curve quickly made out much better than those like ours that delayed. And the same principle applies to flattening the carbon curve. And I think most of all, it reminds us that social solidarity really is key. That and the even more encouraging protests around racial equality in our country are a reminder that the um, 
ideas that have kind of dominated our political life for the last 30 or 40 years since Ronald Reagan are just wrong. The ideas that markets solve all problems and that everything will be well if we just concentrate on getting rich ourselves, those just aren't true. Um, you can't solve the kind of problems we face unless one's able to come together as, as societies, as communities, as civilizations. Uh, look out for each other, not so much for ourselves. What advice do you have for youth activists at this point? Oh, I don't think youth activists need any advice from me. They're doing a very good job, especially on climate change. And, you know, I've always, most of my work's always been with young people. I mean, I founded 350.org with myself and seven college students. Um, so I've always thought that young people were doing most of the work here. Part of me worries that they're doing such a good job that the rest of us will look at them and think, oh, we can offload the worst problem the world ever faced onto the shoulders of high school sophomores, you know, which is crazy. So I guess the only advice I'd have is to just keep reminding your elders that you need them exercising the power to vote and the power to move money, to make financial institutions as well as political institutions uh, actually face this problem square on. So don't let older people off the hook make sure that they're doing a lot of this work. It's going to take all of us, not just one segment of the population. You're right. You said it. You said it. Thank you so much, Bill, for talking with me today.